to me, the biggest story of the week, the one that I'm most excited about, is our next story. Joining us right now, Vladimir Arapetian. He is a astrophysicist, a solar physicist, an astrobiologist. He is at NASA Goddard. Uh, uh, Dr. Arapetian, thank you so much for joining us. Do I have to call you Dr. Dr. Dr.? <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> doctor, doctor, doctor. D this is very exciting. Seven Earth-sized planets were discovered uh, on a uh, dwarf star. How far away is this dwarf star? I thought uh, five light years. Is that accurate? Forty. Forty light years. So it's not like we're going there tomorrow. Yeah, I want to tell you a little bit about this uh, discovery. This is a, an incredible discovery because it challenges our understanding of how Earth-like planets may form around low-mass stars. And uh, the planetary worlds around Trappist-1, this is the, the name of the star, uh, should be very exotic and very different from our own. So, um, so just it's incredible that before 1995, we didn't even uh, realize that we have so many strange world, uh, worlds around us. And now we have discovered over 3,500 yeah. exoplanets and with uh, 2,000 uh, planetary systems. We, so, we, uh, we couldn't even tell there were exoplanets until very recently. Yeah, right, yeah. So all we knew about like eight planets in our solar system. Right. So, yeah, so I want to talk a little bit about this strange system. So um, let me introduce me the start of the show, uh, Trappist One and Seven Dwarfs. Because <laughs> <laughs> it is a red dwarf that is not yeah. like the sun, right? Well, well, it is much, much cooler. I, 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 I call it a cool star, actually. It's a cool mother star and seven dwarfs. So it's, it's twice cooler than our sun. It's um, a little bit less than 3,000 Kelvins. Uh, surface temperature, so um, and it's uh, ten times smaller. Uh, it's um, uh, it's it's a little bit larger than Jupiter. Okay, it's really really a small wow. star. Star, wow. yeah, There's yes, like and, and and because yeah. it's so cool and uh, small, um, it's pretty dim. It's about two thousand times dimmer than our sun. However, um, it, it is a very magnetically active star. It has a very strong magnetic fields, and this star flares. And it flares pretty frequently, and that's because this star is a young star. It's only 440 million years old star. And so in perspective of uh, human life, I would say it's only five years old. Okay, so because it's expected to live for like another 10 billion years. And imagine that you have a young star and, uh, uh, and and seven seven dwarfs around this star, um, so uh, to, um, to and and uh, and um, uh, um, uh, the the conditions that uh, that exoplanets experience are pretty exotic because imagine that you take our Earth and move a hundred times closer to our sun that we are right now, okay, hundred times close, so we will be grilled. But because the star is so cool and dim, so imagine or not, uh, the conditions are habitable. So, habitable. so we call, they call, you call, we, I don't call them anything, but you call planets, or I've heard planets that are Earth-like, could have, could support Earth-like life, Goldilocks plants, because they're in the Goldilocks zone. Well, and liquid water can, yeah. They got water, they got the temperatures are within right. a reasonable right. Uh, range. Right. There are Goldilocks planets in this system. Yes. Yes. So we, we have discovered number of Goldilocks planets uh, and in principle, if the conditions are mild, I'm talking about, you know, ionizing radiation from the star, then the conditions are favor could be favorable for life because water is such an important ingredient of life. It's the major solvent of life. So we need water in order to dissolve uh, uh, molecules of life and create more complex complex uh, biological molecules. However, imagine that you if if you place a planet pretty close to its host star, then um, the X-ray uh, X-ray emission, UV emission can really uh, be detrimental for the the the, the life forms. Um, so so they, this, so that's why it is so important to understand each system, each star, 
you know, uh, uh, um, uh, separately in the case by case study. So I am really, really excited about this system because we have uh, a, uh, a good laboratory and uh, this system is pretty close. We have an upcoming mission in the James Webb Space Telescope that will be launched in November next year. And this telescope will present an absolutely incredible opportunity to, um, to observe uh, uh, this, this closed world. And um, so the Proxima B, that was another, you probably heard about this discovery, that was the, an exoplanet that was uh, uh, recently detected around the uh, Proxima Centauri, which is the, the closest star to us. This is a little bit farther away, but still pretty close to us to be observed by uh, a powerful telescope like James Webb Space Telescope. So that's why I would say that we, are, we, we live in a golden era of the, of the space exploration. And I would, I, I'm really excited that um, in a few years we will have much better understanding uh, of the, uh, the nature of this world and uh, understand through the eyes of those exoplanets to understand the life on our own planet. Yes, I understand when James Webb actually gets up and operational, then it will be able to search for signs of oxygen, methane, and ozone. Is it in the in these planet in, in these these seven planets? Well, yes. If you're lucky enough, if he, if if the if the atmosphere is thick enough, yes, definitely we will be try we, we will try to look for signatures of life. And uh, because, the, you know, the nitrogen, for instance, this is the um, one important ingredient of, of, of life. So no wonder that we have 77% of molecular nitrogen in the Earth atmosphere. It's not a cosmic coincidence. It's a requirement for life. And then we have another thing, another gas is a, a, an oxygen, which is the, uh, a, a, a product of photosynthesis. So, um, and, um, and, um, uh, 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 and then methane, it's the product of the of the decay. Uh, uh, so so those 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 gases trace life. They're not life by itself by definition, but they they trace life. And uh, of course, we're not gonna see those little green men, but we will be able to know uh, whether uh, conditions experienced you know here on Earth are are typical, because we want to know whether our planet is typical, whether our planet planetary system, solar system is typical. Uh, so, so, and I would imagine in the next 10, 20 years, we will have definitely uh, much, much more, um, um, much more, um, a, uh, a, 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 a more, more, more exact answers to those questions. I guess one of the questions, one of the cosmic questions humans have asked is, are we alone in the universe? So that's one question that will maybe not be answered, but we'll, you know, we'll have some evidence that maybe we're not unique. Maybe our planet is not unique. I think it was Arthur C. Clarke who said that the, there are two possibilities, either we are alone or we aren't alone, and both of those are terrifying. I know. So just... <laughs> but I also would guess that we will, can we learn something about ourselves from what we learn uh, from these planets? Absolutely. Um, so this, uh, uh, you know, this 3,000, uh, over 3,500 discovered planets uh, uh, provide a unique opportunity to, uh, to look for signatures of life and to understand our place in the universe. Because the question of are we alone uh, suggests that uh, we want to understand that whether even microbial life, you know, that now we understand that the microbial life should be pretty, pretty typical, should be pretty widespread, you know, uh, uh, across the universe, across our galaxy, for instance. Uh, and uh, so now that we understand, we, we now, you know, since 1953 and the experiments of Mira and Euler uh, and, and, and uh, 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 Yuri, uh, 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 when the, the, the first um, uh, amino acids were, uh, was synthesized, you know, in the laboratory, now uh, our group, uh, together with the, the, the in, in Japan, so I have collaborators at the Tokyo Institute of Technology. We are trying now to reproduce um, a uh, nuclear basis, the, the, the building blocks of RNA molecule uh, from those, wow. um, uh, yeah, from the gases of uh, the, the, that we, we believe were, uh, were uh, major constituents of the early Earth. So, so you're trying to answer what is the most one of the most fundamental questions, which is how did life arise from this chemical exactly. stew, 
And if you can simulate that, that is just yet another piece in this in this mystery. Mm -hmm. Although there is always the possibility that it came in, you know, hitched a ride on a meteorite well, it came, and came but, in. But it had to arise somewhere, right? Yeah. Right, right, exactly right. <laughs> so that uh, the um, the uh, 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 the group that uh, I'm heading now, it's called the uh, Mission to Young Earth 2.0, and the major goal of this group is to uh, to find another planet wow. pregnant with life. Wow. So uh, we're trying to find a planet in the, you know, making life. So because one thing that we have a theory, another thing, we reproduce this, we calibrate this theory, validate the theory in the lab, and uh, the, the, the ultimate goal is to find it, to find it, um, a planet, you know, around young sun, resembling our sun 3.8 billion years ago, and now that we know what kind of molecules to look for, we will look for the major, you know, simplest ingredients that are gonna make complex sugars and eventually, uh, and eventually, uh, uh, building blocks of RNA and DNA molecule. Oh, so, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm really very excited about it, and I would tell you that um, by the end of this year, we will have results of our experiments. We have our first, first paper about the first, uh, first the production of amino acids from, um, from uh, a uh, simplest, from bare uh, ke chemical elements like molecular nitrogen, Fantastic. carbon dioxide, uh, methane, and a little bit of water vapor. So, but- uh, Well, you just yeah. throw them in a box, shake them up, and life emerges? I mean, what a, it's gotta have well, some, conditions well, must be very so, specific, yeah? Well, well, one thing that I'm learning and uh, an understanding now that in order to see that if you if you throw these molecules and wait then nothing will happen and that's why from that point from that standpoint only miracle can make it. right however if you throw this molecule and supply some energy some su supply some energy and make uh, and, and this this energy you know, like like lightning or uh, 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 or or energetic particles, like in our model, uh, energetic protons from the young sun. Then those 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 um, energetic particles they dissociate uh, those molecules. They create simpler pieces, and those simple pieces suddenly becomes reactive. They start to start to create new pieces of mo new new molecules that are much more reactive than the original molecules, the inert molecules, like molecular nitrogen. So, and, and then you add them to, the, to, to water and irradiate with, with the protons, you get, you know, um, a nucle nuclear basis. So life needs a lot of energy. So I say that, um, you know, water is cheap, but life is expensive. It's <laughs> it, it is, it is energetically expensive. It's it really, this, it is amazing. And not, I mean, I remember talking to scientists in the early 90s saying, well, we, you know, there might be other planets out there, but we have never observed that. Now we know, not only do we know there are other planets out there, but there are Earth-like planets out there, and there are thousands of them. And now you're attempting to demonstrate in this experiment in Japan that it might not even be very far-fetched that the particular conditions for life to emerge might actually be common enough it sounds like you're, you can't prove this, but it sounds like given the billions and billions of stars and billions and billions of galaxies, well, that the likelihood the is, we've seen so many planets already, mm. that there exactly. is life out there. That this, is it, you can't prove it, but it, it seems highly likely. Is that accurate? Absolutely, it, it seems highly likely, and um, the astrobiologists, uh, uh, you know, from uh, 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 yeah, the inter and our community, astrobiological community, are pretty optimistic that uh, uh, a life should be a mandatory state of matter. Wow. Even I would that, that would way. Put some so not merely in. have ex not merely exist by chance, but actually, right everywhere, everywhere, given the circumstances, you need to have. You know, certain bare gases. Mm -hmm. You need to have energy. I, I would compare it like you know, I, I, when 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 I trying to explain what life needs, I say, what do you need in order to make a, a, a cookie? Right. You know, li life cookies, let's say. So you need, <laughs> you need, um, you need chocolate a chips, flour, butter, yeah, yeah. and an yeah, oven. Yeah. Oh, yeah, right. And then oven, that's your, that's your energy. The sun, yeah. That's supplied by the sun, exactly. You need the dough and water. That's all. Three ingredients 
I mean, generally, and given the chance, but you need to apply this oven, you know, you, have, you need to keep this uh, dough, you know, in the oven for about 100 million years. <laughs> and, and, this, and this kind of, um, and this kind of so-called, it's not a miracle anymore then. It's just a mandatory requirement because you keep trying to keep producing pieces and you, you help the complexity to go on and on and on, producing the, 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 uh, uh, up to some point. It's like, mm. you know, uh, you have a small wave, you know, ripples, ripples on the water, right? So you add more energy, uh, you incre increase the amplitude of it, and in in eventually you create a tsunami. You create a, a rock wave. And imagine at some level, uh, the rock wave, it's the, a, uh, a structure that doesn't need any, any, um, any additional uh, uh, conditions to, uh, to uh, function. It will now, you know, interact with rock waves like its own. That's what life is. It will forget about its dark past, about its, you know, uh, I, um, I, um, the, uh, the, the, the primitive conditions. It will live and it will interact and will reproduce wow. and mm. will follow Darwinian evolution. And of course, once you have reproduction, Everything the rest follows. follows. <laughs> <Right>. So. <laughs> right. um, Absolutely. Until the sun gets nasty again and fries the inside oh, shut up. on it. <laughs> now, what about, so then we've got all of the pieces for Fermi's paradox because we, we can posit that life is commonplace, must be commonplace. So why have, where are they? Why okay, haven't so we met them? That's another question. Uh, uh, the, uh, when I talk about life, I, I, uh, I imply a microbial life. It doesn't, it's not civilization, I understand. No, no, no. But, and, and look, it, uh, yeah, you know, life on Earth started 3.8 billion years ago. Right. Yeah. Takes a while. And it, yeah, and it existed for, you know, for a couple of billions of years as, um, as a, uh, uh, well, at least one and a half billion years, as a single-celled organism. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. right. It's only later uh, uh, it started to become more complex. Uh, you know, multicellular organism eventually. Yeah, and, and look, uh, the human life is not a necessary, um, a, um, a, uh, uh, I would say, form of life. For instance, before, uh, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the... They might just be, you know, sage brush. Uh, yeah, that, well, that's pretty complex. Uh, yeah, that yeah. Before, that, yeah, before the disappearance of dinosaurs 65 years ago, yeah. you know, we didn't have, we didn't have a niche you know, mm, for right, life. Right. Dinosaurs occupied all possible niches. And it was a cosmic coincidence that, you know, they were killed and right. they opened mm -hmm. up a new avenue right. for us. No asteroid, right. no mammals, yep. no mammals, yeah. no space so, travel. Yeah, so, yeah. so therefore, uh, you know, us, and there is a big, big uh, gap uh, in terms of the uh, evolution right. from mm. single-celled organisms right. to us, right. so that might resolve the uh, the, the Fermi's paradox uh, that we, uh, you know, it, it, and 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 you have to also keep in mind that um, you know to produce humans, we are very very vulnerable to the um, uh, uh, you know uh, to external conditions for to stellar catastrophes. Right. Imagine that you have a um, you have a supernova explosion and the star is not that far away, it can kill life. Right. Uh, you know, the, 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 some of the calculations show that you can, uh, 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 you can uh, really uh, uh, reduce the, the amount of ozone, you know, the atmosphere mm. by, by like 70% for, for many months, uh, a, a, to letting the, the ionizing radiation pass through the, through the atmosphere. So a lot of things can go on. Uh, and um, and so so if you take that in the perspective of uh, life on other planets, yeah, I'm pretty optimistic that we can find it, but um, uh, but uh, it will take some time. Okay. However, mic microbial life much will be much more easier to spot. Okay, and we definitely should go for it.